Praise God for air conditioning, right? Amen. Give thanks for air conditioning. Give thanks. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? It's always a beautiful day when the house is over. So I hope you have your Bible still open to March 16. If not, go ahead and reopen. We're going to look at those first eight verses. The book of Mark, the 16th chapter, and the very first verse. So you can follow along. You know this is our last chapter in the book of Mark. So I invite one woman to preach next. We'll find Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, the mother, Mary the mother of James and Salom, brought the aromatic spices so they might go ahead and anoint him. Well, remember in the previous chapter, Mary Magdalene had already anointed the body of Christ. And normally, when someone died, they would go ahead and anoint their bodies. But there was a problem. And what was that problem? Sabbath. So they had to wait all Friday night, all day Sabbath, and then Sunday morning. Do you remember what Mary and Martha said to Jesus when he suggested they open the tomb? Yes. She said it was going to stink. So there were some, some issues, weren't there? Very early on the first day of the week, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. Verse 3. They had been asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Zarbay says it will take two to three men to move this stone. The soldiers aren't going to move it because they know they would be executed for breaking the seal. So they're wondering, we're headed to anoint the body of our loved Savior. Who's going to move the tomb? The stone. Verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which Mark says, which was very large, had been rolled back. Verse 5. And then they went into the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Literally means they were terrified. They actually have three emotions. First they were amazed. Then they were in awe. And then they were terrified. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. In verse 7, go tell the disciples, even Peter. Isn't it amazing how loving our God is? And Peter is so discouraged because he not only is is Jesus dead, but he had betrayed him. Go to the disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. And then they went out and ran from the tomb. For terror and bewilderment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone because they were what? They were afraid. They were in a state of fear. So Mark tells us early, early Sunday morning. And Jesus is still in his tomb. So our just tells us that when Pilate sent 100 Roman soldiers to guard that tomb. And wouldn't you call that overkill? If he wanted to be sure nothing happened. If Satan had had it his way, that tomb would be sealed forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I can imagine the scene. Just try to see Satan just pacing all Friday night, all day Sabbath. He's pacing back and forth. And ever so often he's asking, is the tomb still sealed? And his other evil angel saying, yes, Master. Nothing to worry about. We've got this covered. Sabbath ends. Mark said it's early Sunday morning. 
The servant Lord tells us that God sent his most powerful angel. And I like the way she describes it. She says, he rolled the stone away as if it were a pebble. And Satan, for the first time, knows that he is defeated. The war is over. Amen. And he realizes he's going to face death for his sins. Mm. The Roman soldiers, normally strong, hardened men, fall to the ground as they dead. And the angel calls for Jesus to come forth. And he comes forth and what's the first thing he says? Finally, he just tells us, I am the resurrection and the life. Well, those hundred soldiers began to run, probably in many different directions. And the priest, remembering that Jesus said that he'd be resurrected on the third day, were headed toward the tomb, and the, and the priest and the soldiers meet. And the high priest says, what happened? And when the soldiers begin to tell them about the resurrection, Ellen White says to Hodges, his lips were moving, but no words were coming out. The soldiers almost gave up, and finally he said, don't tell the truth. Tell them there was no resurrection. Tell them we fell asleep. And the disciples stole the body. Now, obviously, they weren't thinking very clearly. It's confused, conceivable that a hundred soldiers that a few wouldn't stay awake. And if they were asleep, how would they know who stole the body? Well, the soldiers, they were on a mission. And the mission was to save their lives because the tomb was open, the seal was broken. That was a death decree for a soldier. They were headed to Pilate. And to tell him, and, and Zara says that they told him the truth. That Jesus was resurrected. Now Pilate had felt badly that he was not strong enough to stand up to the Jews. But from that moment on, and all peace left him. Eventually he would take his life. He was so terrified. So you have Satan terrified. You have the soldiers terrified. You have the priests who are terrified. You have Pilate who is now terrified. And verses 7 and 8 tells us that the women were terrified. And then there's one more group. If you hold your finger in Mark 16, but jump over to John 20, verse 19, we discovered that even the disciples were terrified. John 20, verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the disciples had gathered together, locked the doors of the place because they were what? They were afraid. The Roman soldiers were going to break in and arrest them and put them on trial and then crucify them. There is one word that connects all these characters together. The priests, the soldiers, the women, the disciples. One word. And what was that word? They were terrified, weren't they? They were fearful. Our society Is crippled by fear. Ann Landers, those of you younger ones, of course, but those of you old like me, will know that she was a columnist. And she would answer people's questions. And when she was asked what the most common concern there was, her answer was quick and sharp. It says, fear is the most underlying issue that people write her about. King Louis XV of France, terrified by the thought of death. He was so terrified he wouldn't let any of his people talk about it, and he had all the tombstones removed so he wouldn't notice cemeteries. It's a little overkill. And then there's Joseph Stalin, killed millions of Jews and Germans. He was so terrified of being assassinated 
And every night he went to bed, he changed rooms, hoping that nobody would know which bed he was in. There are many people in our world, especially in the, this part of the country, the United States, that live in fear, that on the run from fear. And it's been said that even many Christians are paralyzed by fear. And Jesus, before, before his crucifixion, said that when he comes back in the clouds of glory, that there will be men and women who will cry for the rocks to fall upon them because they are consumed by fear. So you have Satan, the Roman soldiers, the priests, the Pilate, the women, the disciples, all terrified by fear. The difference is, after the resurrection, the women and the disciples were consumed by joy because they knew that Jesus was resurrected. So, I have a question for you. Hey, Brenda, can you help me? You're a real soldier. I appreciate it. What does the resurrection mean to you? And Brenda, just raise your hand. Brenda will come out and let you share what the resurrection means to you. Don't be shy. We're among family and friends. What does the resurrection mean to you? Our freedom. Okay, our freedom. I don't believe I can hear you. Brady, go ahead. Raise your hand so Brady can see who's, who's going to say something. So that everybody can. What does the resurrection mean to you? Jesus died the second death for all of us. Okay. Yeah, Brady, and he would have died if it was only you or yeah. me. Yeah. That's true. It would be, um, I feel like I have hope because his, he was resurrected and we have hope of eternal life. <clears throat> the resurrection is living proof that G Jesus lives as he said. Living proof that we do have an everlasting life before us. Amen. Amen. Come over here. This must be the conservative side because no one's talking to me. <laughs> no pressure. The, the power of the resurrection is mine, um, and that same power can resurrect me spiritually from the dead. Yes, amen. Good of you, Brenda. The resurrection is everything. Now, if we don't have the resurrection, our faith is, is meaningless. Well, That's true. If we don't have the resurrection, there's nothing. That's true. In reality, there's also there's more to that. It's kind of uh, the undoing of every all of all of Satan's work in this world. Right, it's, it's, it's basically the return to right. That's right. We've got four more. And that's what we're going to cut it off. Look these last four. Would the what would the resurrection be? Um, when um, people die and Jesus comes back and you take them home? Amen. Would that be? Yes. Resurrection? Promise of the resurrection for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Cool. <laughs> you did good. Satan convinced Eve in the Garden of Eden. That if she ate of the forbidden fruit, she would surely not die. That introduced sin. That made it necessary for Jesus to die because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So the resurrection means that Christ conquered death, Amen. making the first resurrection a reality for those that choose to die in Christ. To me, it's uh, a peace to know that this is not my home. Yes. That things will not be the same when we get to heaven. 
Heaven will be peace and joy and love and not so much death and hate. <laughs> Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the prototype. And uh, he is uh, he is the firstborn of us. So the next one of us is the is the is the type after him. And the next you know, so, so on and so forth. When you have a new car come out, what is it? It's the prototype. Yes. Jesus is our prototype. The firstborn from the dead. Amen. These are all excellent answers. And they're all <laughs> the correct answers. Thank you very much. So I hope you weren't fearful that maybe there was a wrong answer. <laughs> the life, the ministry, all the people he healed, the people he raised from the dead, all of those things would have been of no account had there not been a resurrection. Amen. Amen. So we are people of the cross, but we are also people of the resurrection. Yes. Amen. Now, I call this sermon fear. I thought about calling this sermon what if. What if there had not been a resurrection? Turn to Revelation 14, 6 and 7. If there had not been a resurrection, God would not have called this church into existence to preach the three angels' message. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I saw another angel flying directly overhead, and he had an eternal gospel. And there would without a resurrection, there'd be no eternal gospel. To proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people, declare with a loud voice, fear God. Now that fear is not an American word. It means to be in awe. Without the resurrection, we can't be in awe of God. It says to give him glory. Without the resurrection, there's no way to glorify God. And he says, fear God and glory for the hour of what? For the hour of his judgment is come. In the American judicial system, you are innocent or proven guilty. In God's judicial system, you are guilty. Only Jesus is innocent. Amen. And we are made righteous <coughs> by his blood. His righteousness. Without a high priest, there's no atonement. Turn to Hebrews 4, 14. Paul reminds us in the book of Hebrews, the ministry of Jesus Christ after the resurrection. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. In other words, don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. No matter what happens, no matter what arrows shake, Satan throws at us. Verse 15, For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy, find grace whenever we need help. Amen. Because of the resurrection, we have confidence. Not self-confidence, but confidence in Christ. Because He is our resurrected Lord. Because of the resurrection, we have an advocate. 1 John 2, verse 11. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. We have an advocate. Jesus is our judge, our jury, and our defense attorney. You can't lose. My little children, these things are written to you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. And if there was no resurrection, there'd be no millennium. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. I have a friend once asked me, why in the world do we even teach the millennium? What's it all about? A thousand years? 
Well, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set seals upon him, that he should, be, that he should deceive the nations no more. For a thousand years were fulfilled. And after the thousand years, he'd be loose for a season. The millennium, a thousand years, answers that one word question that troubles all of us. It's the question, why? Why God? Why do these things happen to my family? Why do these things happen to my loved one? Why, Lord? The millennium will start with a lot of tears. Tears of sorrow. Tears of sorrow for people we don't see you there. There'll be some people surprised to see us there. Those tears of sorrow will eventually turn to tears of joy. Amen. But for a thousand years, God is going to let us ask Him over and over, Lord, why? The question that, that plagues us, we can't explain why these things happen, but during the millennium, God will have an answer for all of those things. If there was no resurrection, there would be no heaven. Just look over the next chapter, Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Aren't you glad it's going to be changed? Yes. For the first heaven, the first earth will pass away, and there shall be no more sea. And I'm glad that John didn't mean that literally, because I love the ocean. <laughs> But the ocean separated him from his loved ones. And in verse 2, I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither there shall be any pain for former things. Amen. 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 No pain, no sorrow. No torment. All of the loved ones that we lost who loved Jesus Christ will be reunited. Amen. Imagine the city gates open, those 12 pearly gates open, and the redeemed start coming in. And they, they see Jesus and they, they start throwing their crowns toward him and saying, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God which was slain. They start singing and rejoicing. And the good news is, people like me, is they sing on the cue. <laughs> and I told them, they sing. They're walking on the sea of glass, streets of gold. And there's all this rejoicing going on. And now it tells us something very special. All the saints are there. They're all rejoicing. And one lone figure steps in. The first Adam and the new Adam meet. Amen. Wow. Jesus put his arms out. Adam falls to his knees and weeps. Jesus introduces him to his family and to Eden restored. Amen. Don't let anything stand between you and that moment. Don't let the things of this world, don't let things that people say or things that Satan does to you, don't let anything stand between you Heaven. Because the resurrection is real. Amen. And heaven is real. Amen. And the choice is yours. No one can make you choose to turn against Jesus. You have to make that choice. 
And no matter how much persecution Satan may throw against you, God is there by your side. It may look dark, it may look troubling, it may look impossible, but He's there. He has promised never to abandon us, no matter how bad things do. And when things are confusing, we, need, we must always remember who God is, that He is just and merciful and trustworthy. Amen. Satan is going to try to deceive us so that we will abandon him. Just as those priests abandoned God when they crucified Jesus. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. From this day forward, choose to be a committed follower of Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for the resurrection. Thank you for the life and death of Jesus, but Lord, thank you for that resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of the coming resurrection of the dead in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of your son's return. 10,000 and 10,000 angels. And thank you, Lord, for giving us that millennial time. We finally have the answers to the questions that have troubled us. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 567. You will stand with me.